this part of um, of the module we would like to learn how to place your short reads on the reference genome well first of all what is reference genome how to place them we also learn standards uh, for the files uh, how to store those short uh, short reads with alignments so information about the read and information where this read is aligned and we also discuss typical goals of the ChIP-seq experiment, uh, as well as the first steps at visualization and analysis. But uh, please see it as a, uh, not analysis, but QC and analysis. And that's very important because the fun part comes probably after what I'm talking. But what I will be talking is absolutely necessary in every experiment because you want to be sure that what you're dealing after and do different interesting discoveries with the data you trust and understand. That's the first. And I have a couple of disclaimers maybe. First, first of all, in order to do it, you probably will need months and maybe many months to learn the whole process. That's from experience with Martin Epigenetic Lab and the students who are working there. It takes some time because it's many, many, many steps and they're a little bit task dependent. So it's not that it will be a black box or set of rules which you always constantly follow and get a good result. No, you have to variate from this. This is first. And second, uh, we will be using some, some of the tools which are available. Most of them are just developed by our fellow, fellow bioinformaticians. Bio so they are free. They are of good qualities, but they are changing. They are evolving together with evolving technology. And if you used, for example, some tools six months ago, then you didn't use it, then you come back and try to use the new version of some tools. Something may break. So always remember to understand the tool, your current tool you are using and check that you're able to use it. All right, uh, so the first we are going to talk about is, and we see it on both of them. Yes, it's a short read alignment. And I specifically, uh, draw it in this way. So we have a black box. Here's a gray box, which called a liner. And there are two in components. One is your fast queue file with short reads. And fast queue files for every read, we have four lines. Uh, so the first line is header, sequence, some spacer line, and the quality. And then we have uh, we have a reference genome. So on the on the bottom. And this is just sequence. And at the end, we have an alignment, so-called alignment file. So what is the reference genome? Reference genome, as, as I just said, is a sequence of ACGT. Uh, sometimes, if you take the human reference genome, AG19, it's not the last version, but it's the most popular version for analysis, and you will just try to search for any letters but A, C, G, T. You will find some. You actually find three letters which are not. By some reason, authors of this build put some um, uh, it's um, redundancy, uh, not redundancy. How to go? So there, there is Y letter which represents several uh, several nucleotides. So in the new build, we will have more of those. So the genome actually will not look traditionally as a sequence of four letters. So just some stats, human genome, current human genome, as you know, is about three gigabases. Mouse genome is a little bit shorter. As an example, the plant genome, some plant genomes are short, like Arabidopsis, but some plant genome are very, very long. And of course, all this one has to keep in mind when one does alignment, because the larger genome you're using, the longer your alignment will take. Uh, will take. If you use a very short alignment, or short alignment like C. elegans or yeast, your alignment will be blazingly fast using exactly the same tools, exactly the same computers. So where you access reference genome is better to use not the genome from your friend or from somebody, unless you're doing some custom work, but download it from reliable sources. And one of them is NCBI, of course, or you can download from UCSC, uh, on the browser, you have, there is download uh, button and all species are there. We will, in the tutorial, we will try to check this. Uh, so now we have a genome, we have our FASTQ file, and we would like to do alignment. There are many alignments, and 
Of course, alignments were known before next generation sequencing uh, data appeared. We, uh, alignments were developed before, but the whole area was open for the people, computer scientists, who would like to develop fast aligners for short reads. Typically, they're using all kind of heuristics, so it's not exact match. And we are not, actually, we don't want that our alignment is exact match. We want to allow for reads to have some wobble because we, as we learned in, in, in the morning, our sequenced reads have certain sequencing errors and we don't want to be very rigid. We would like to allow, uh, allow for some wobble. There are two kinds, two major kinds of aligners. One are based on uh, hashing and the second uh, class, which actually we will be focusing is uh, based on Boros Wheeler uh, transformation, um, compression. Uh, and here I listed names of, of those alignments. I just wanted also to mention that also the goal of this, uh, of this module is to give you some information, some and uh, introduce you to certain lingo and to some names, which you will remember maybe when later you will uh, meet in your work and you know what does it mean. So we, we are not going to many, many details, but so the base, uh, based on hashing aligners, what they're doing, they basically hash genome. So if, for example, your sequences are 30 bases, your short reads, so it chopped genome into those 30 bases, the whole genome, step by one, and create a huge table. So the key of this table is the sequence and the value is the location. And then it's very easy. You can just query this table. You look up this table. You look at your, at your sequence, at your FASTQ file. You take your sequence. You have a huge table. You look up where position is. That's a very, of course, simple way of showing it because, as I mentioned, we allow mismatches and those, those aligners take care of a bigger table, not only table based on the genome itself, but allowing some mismatches in every genomic location. So the, the second aligners are faster, they're most, more efficient because they're using compression. And that's a trick. And your space of your search space is smaller, and that's why they're faster. While the first type of alignment are most, uh, align, aligners are more sensitive. So that's a trade-off, speed versus sensitivity. Because we don't want to have very, very precise aligner, which will find absolutely optimum solution to place our fast queue file onto the genome, but it will take months and months. So it's always a trade-off. Um, just also to mention that aligners and the way we align in reads will work for genomic DNA, like whole genome shotgun data, or ChIP-seq. If we would like to align RNA-seq or uh, whole genome bisulfide data, which will be discussed tomorrow, you need to use different aligners or modifications based on the aligners. So here from the literature, relatively recent, a uh, table which compares, uh, compares different aligners and in red, aligners based on transformation and in, in green is hash based aligners. And you can appreciate that the sp speed up of using this Burroughs Villers transformation is about 10 times. So now that's one thing is speed. On the next slide, from the same uh, publication, we have sensitivity and specificity of different aligners. So what it shows here, percent of reads aligned properly, aligned correctly, uh, percent of reads aligned, and percent of reads aligned properly. So you can see that BWA, in a sense, hits a sweet spot. It has relatively high percentage of all reads aligned and relatively high percentage of all reads aligned properly. There are some other aligners which can have higher, higher percentage. For example, MAC, it's a previous, like from the same author, previous version of aligner. It aligns more reads, but the proper alignment is much more poor. So it's all to show you, we are going to use BWA uh, for, for it's very popular aligner and to show you that it's not a bad aligner if we're considering these properties, this characteristic of it. 
uh, when we choose a liner, of course, we can use default parameters, but it's good to at least to try it, and we will try in, in, the, in the lab part to see what parameters are available for us and what parameters we are choosing. As Martin already mentioned, normally what is happening when we have a long read, let's say 100 bases, it's very, very expensive, would be very expensive even using transformation-based aligners to use the whole 100 bases and to try to place it on genome. Because as a rule of thumb, you can say that if you have a, a stretch of DNA with 20 bases and use some simple aligner method like blood, you can place arbitrary sequence of 20 mere somewhere on the human genome with probably some mismatches and some gaps and so but you can place it. But as soon as you start to have 25 mere, 30 mere, if it's placed on human genome, then it means it originates from human genome. It's very hard at random to place 32 mere on human genome. That's not for nothing. The seed for the aligner FWA, for BWA, the default is 32 bases. So basically, 32 bases we take from the beginning of our read, when it's 75 or 100 bases or 50, we take the 32 bases and try to place it on, on the genome. And the rest of the sequence, of course, is used, but it's used as a local, local improvement. So we basically look up if the tail of the read, we align the seed, and sometimes the seed aligns in multiple locations, and then we use the rest of, this, of the read to place it better. So that's what, what happens. So uh, this is uh, a publication, the reference for you, if you would like to, to, to check it out, BWA. And uh, as I mentioned, it, it has a good balance between accuracy and speed. So now imagine we run our liner and we are going to do it. We're kind of going backwards because in the, uh, in the lab, we are going to do this, and in the lab, we will be following exactly the steps I'm describing now. Uh, so the, what, are, what we can have? We, we look at the result of our alignments, and we can have reads which are uniquely aligned. That's gold. That's what we want. That's the first class. What else can we have? Obviously, we can have reads which are not aligned. So we tried. No way. They're not aligned. Those are unfortunately wasted, and... There are many sources of uh, what are what could be those reads. Do, do, do you have an idea what could be those reads? Contamination. Contamination is one thing. Second, of course, if due to sequencing error, this read scrambled so much that it can't really find a place. That's more rare, but contamination is, is one thing. What else? Could be contamination that read comes from different species, like bacterial, or for example, it has adapter sequence in it, a long, like say, 10 mere. So it's too, too expensive. At the very beginning of the read, we have 10 mere, which doesn't belong to human genome, and it was not properly trimmed. We can't align it. So what next class of the, of the, of the reads? It's properly paired reads. And maybe here I'd like to uh, use a few minutes. So we already heard from Martin that there are two flavors of experiment. One is single end and one is pair end. And I will be intermingling, intermingling between two cases. So both single end and pair end. Of course, when we have pair end, we have more information because we have two reads, they're independently aligned, but they also have relationship between them. So when we have pair end experiment, then we can have a pair which is properly paired. So both reads are uniquely aligned and they're uniquely aligned within expected distance from each other, let's say 500 bases. So if reads aligned far away, you will be suspicious whether they are properly paired or something happened. Sometimes it's interesting, actually. So, but if we have parent experiments, the second class uniquely aligned and properly paired. And here I show, show you an example of uh, real, real uh, results. So, uh, when we align proper, uh, when we align parent data, uh, we can reconstruct fragment length distribution. So what is shown here is on the x-axis is DNA fragment length as reconstructed as a distance between start of the first read 
and the end of the second read, the whole fragment. And uh, the height, of course, is uh, just frequency. And you can see that's a typical shape. It's not Gaussian. We have maximum somewhere around 150 to 100. That's a typical, typical values. And then we have a long tail. So some fragments are long, but we have less probability to have long fragments. And the first plot comes from data which was syndicated. And Martin mentioned that there is another kind of uh, library construction when we use native uh, uh, protocol, which is MNA digested data. And in, on the bottom, we have the small insert, which shows us the fragment distribution for the MNA digested data. And here is very nice because we immediately see biology because the peak, the peak is very sharp here. And the maximum of this peak is located exactly in 146. So that's a nucleosome, a nucleosome periodicity. So that's typical, typical distributions. And we would like that properly paired uh, reads are live within, within the, this range. So then, of course, we have properly paired. What else? We can have non-properly paired. That's another class. And non-properly paired can be of different kind. When one read in the pair is aligned, that's all right. But another is not, just not aligned, probably because of sequencing care or some other reasons. However, we can have both of the reads perfectly aligned and uniquely aligned. But what can happen to those reads? That just may be a question to you. So imagine one read is aligned on chromosome 1 and second read is aligned on chromosome 17. And we see this. They both align. Everything is OK. So this can be alignment error because we have symptony between different, different genomic regions. And with a couple of mismatches, we can place better. Remember that alignments are heuristic, right? They kind of try to place read better. But if there is one mismatch in one location and two mismatches in another location, it will still report us one mismatch, the best, absolutely best alignment. But maybe the true location is with two mismatches. We don't know this. Maybe the data, especially if you work with data like mouse, and it is very polymorphic data. So it, it can be all, all kind of things. However, placement of reads on different chromosome can be also reflection of translocations. If we have data coming from transformed genome, it can be true situations that we have pair, uh, pair and reads spanning a region of the genome where translocation happens. Our reference doesn't have this, but when the real, uh, real sample has it, and when we place our reads into the reference, reads end up in completely different places of the genome. So this is an interesting, for some of you it can be interesting because it can be very relevant to the research project. Or if two reads are uh, improperly having proper orientation. So typically, if it's pair end, they should face each other, right? We sequence one from um, five prime to three prime, and another one on opposite strand from five prime to three prime. But if they have opposite orientation, it can be sign of inversion. So just just to mention this. Um, so then, which we already discussed a lot in in, in the morning. Uh, reads can um, can have it duplicated or or multiplicated. When we, by the way, when we say duplicated reads, of course they can be multiplicated. We can have two copies of the same read, or we can have multiple copies. Now, of course, if we work with single end data, even looking at the FASTQ file, we can say which reads, which reads are duplicated. You just look for the same sequence. Right? Because if read is, is positioned in exactly the same place in the genome, it should have the same sequence. And actually, for duplicated read, we require that the sequence is exactly the same. Because if sequence is different, it could be artifact of amplification. But we run, of course, tools, special tools after alignment tools to detect duplicated reads. Now, if we have parent experiment. When we call duplicated reads, it's still the, lingu the language is duplicated reads. But we're actually talking about duplicated fragments. So we call fragment duplicated if both reads in the fragment, read 1 and read 2, are 
exact have aligned have been aligned to exactly the same position of the genome and have exactly the same sequence. So then fragment called duplicated. Of course, if you think about it, the chances now let's talk about like questions we have before. Should we keep those duplicated reads or not? Uh, and I uh, actually I think I somewhere I have yeah this slide maybe maybe let's look at this slide. So now what is our expectation? And I know that some people actually look at look at this question in depth. What is expectation for a read to be duplicated? Now we have say 50 mir read single end uh, experiment 50 50 basis uh, long read. Now, what coverage in the position, in some position of, gen of the genome, we should have in order to have at least one read to be duplicated? It's 50. If we have coverage more than 50 and our read length is 50, then there is no way we can get more than 50 without having two reads being exactly uh, aligned to exactly the same location. It's, it's clear, isn't it? We can't have this tower of higher than 50, let's say 51. If we have 51, then in this particular region, we should have uh, more than one, at least one read to have exactly the same copy. So that's how you can estimate what to do with duplicated reads. If you are working this typical cheap seek experiment, the true coverage shouldn't be for, for, from, from the data we normally work at the moment, shouldn't be higher than 100, 200. If it's single end read, maybe yes, then you, you would like to choose your duplicated reads. But also try to do this with some care, because of course when you accept duplicated reads, then you will have some locations, which are spurious locations, you are getting just because you stuck on each other those duplicated reads. Now, if you want to study this, what would be the way to study those duplicated reads? Just select just duplicated reads and try to see where they are aligned. Maybe there are some genomic locations where they are aligned. Maybe this duplication is due to some sequence complexity or something. So just give you, yes. Uh, what if the duplication is actually because of increase of the number? So dupli uh, you, you, your question is, uh, what is the origin? Why we get this? Yeah. So, for the technologies, uh, Illumina technologies we are talking at the moment, they're due to PCR amplifications. So it just, just you have the same molecule sequenced twice. But then how can you distinguish between the ones that are coming from PCR and the ones that actually are in, like, increased copy numbers? You, you cannot, of course. You, you, do, you don't know how to distinguish. The question is whether it's actually PCR or you expect. And somewhere in the previous slide, I put for you that, for example, if you are looking not cheap seek but exome sequencing with coverage tens of thousands, so you have small region of the genome which is covered deeply, deeply, deeply. Of course, there you expect a lot of duplicated reads and fragments just by nature. So you have no room to place them differently, right, to get this coverage. But here, what typically you do, you just say, I can't distinguish these two. I don't believe the chances that they are true biological different, that I actually sequence two different copies of DNA as low, are low, high chance that they are coming from the same molecule, I collapse them. I only consider it once. And remember, like just what, what I said, it's not necessarily duplicated. So some reads are multiplicated. And you can find, if you look carefully in your data, you can find that there are some reads multiplicated thousand times by some reason. Maybe there's a very simple sequence and PCR pick it up and just create lots of copies of it. So then the last one, but not least. So we talk about all these possibilities after we aligned, what kind of reads we have. And the last is multi multi mapped reads. So those are reads which are interesting because we don't know. A liner doesn't know where to place it. A line tells us that it can be placed in chromosome 1. If it's exactly the same quality, it can be placed in chromosome 2 or chromosome 15. And we don't know what to do. What are the origin of those, those reads? Yeah. Say it again. Yes. Because we know that mammalian genomes are highly, highly repetitive. Like 40% of human and mouse genomes are actually repeats. We call them repeat sequences, not identical. 
but it's close enough for short reads to 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 generate multiple uh, uh, to be placed in multiple locations. And those are also problematic because if we don't know where to place it, we don't know how to work with those. A liner BWA chosen, we can say maybe not the best, but the strategy also chosen. It's like arbitrary assigns. It out of like ten locations that it can be aligned, BWA arbitrary assigns one location. However, not default, not by default, we can ask BWA to report all locations the read is aligned. So we can, if somebody is interested, and if somebody studies repetitive elements, then that's possibility. So now this uh, the whole story about aligning in multiple location is a little bit of a headache of the analysis of all next uh, generation sequencing experiments. We call we talk about notion of mappability. What is the fraction of the genome which is uniquely mappable, uniquely accessible to us through the next generator sequen sequencing, and what fraction is not? Obviously, the shorter reads are, the smaller genomic mappability is. Like if we have uh, 36 mirror reads, we, we started actually with 27 mirrors, but 36 mirrors, only approximately 80% of the genome is uniquely mappable. Different chromosomes have different, by, by the way, that's also important. Mappability, there is a global value for it, but it's also location specific. There are some locations which are very unmappable, there are some which are very mappable. The longer reads we are, we increase our mappability. So here is is an example, as, as, as you said, this is like example of short reads, reference genome, and in orange we have repeats. So these two red reads can be aligned in this location or in this locations, while green reads are aligned uniquely. So now we have single end data and we have the situation like that. We have quite a few reads which are reported as multi-mapped. Now we have pair end information. So actually if we have pair end experiment and these pairs are related, situation is different. Like, let me come back. So these two reads are not aligned uniquely, multi-mapped, and these two reads are not aligned uniquely. Now we use parent information. We can't help to this fragment. The entire fragment is mapped into the repetitive element. We don't know what to do. However, these two reads are rescued because the pair made of these red reads, the green read, is aligned uniquely, and we can infer what is a true location because we can use the fragment lengths. We can say that uh, these two reads, one green and one red, has to be within, say, 500 bases from each other, and we can find the proper uh, proper placement of those re red uh, red reads. Otherwise, the multiple location, multiple in uh, multiple locations on the genome. Is it? A little bit clear. Maybe it's time to stop for a second if you have questions to talk about this. Yes. Can you not, um, so you to show us for the different aligners. It seems like the both two had like more time and higher density and quantity. So it's, why is it like that? It's uh, no, no, no. It's just like it's for for us for. For GSC, I'm working in Vancouver GSC, it's more historical. BWA was developed earlier when the other aligner was Botai, the running time was was much uh, much higher, and also I think the error rate was it was more error prone. BWA was more stable. Um, then you learn some aligner, you kind of don't want to jump from aligner to aligner, and in particular if you analyze uh, if in your analysis you use multiple sets of the data, you would like to use the same aligner. For example, when we use our data and we would like to compare with some published data, we realign it with BWA and actually using exactly the same parameters. Yes, Botai 2, I use Botai 2. It's, it's a good aligner now and many people using it. It's kind of 
So it's actually faster, a little bit faster than BWA. Yeah. Yes. Um, for the parameters that you all mentioned, like you need the align read and align read and all of those metrics. Yes. Um, is there a possibility to get them to get all of these statistics after? You We're coming to this. Them? Yes. Yes. There is a very good tool which gives us all statistics about our aligners, our alignments. You mentioned good practices to use the same aligner for multiple data sets. I'm wondering if you ever take the unaligned sequences after doing the PWA and then take those and put them into a hash based alignment to get the most out of your data. Uh, yes, not hash based, but I, for example, I sometimes I took uh, unaligned read and used blood. You know, the blood is a heuristic uh, developed by Jim Kent and just try to place it, yes, it's sometimes you have luck and you can find, you can, for example, you have an indel. So all these aligners, they, as soon as the complexity of modification as it grows, for example, you have five basis insertion, aligners start having more difficulties. And if this happens in your seed in first 32 basis, then it's even harder. So we are, we are coming to this, but the default parameters you're allowing only for two mismatches in your seed and no, no insertion deletions. Your all insertion deletions are in the remaining part of the read. Uh, for sure you're wasting, but like basically that's your QC, right? You, you run your alignment, and if you see that 92% of your reads are uniquely aligned, then you are happy. You probably would sacrifice 8% of your reads. Some of them are legitimately don't belong to your experiment, but some of them may be just, yeah, Aligner error, but you can't. You have to. Yeah, it's just a trade-off of speed and and. Um, but it's it's a very good strategy. I don't think we are using this routinely in a pipeline, but it's it could be a good strategy. If your data is very valuable, you can take an align read and just try to use some other aligner. Uh, from my experience, you don't rescue rescue too much, but one can try it. Okay. So we were talking about small mat reads, and so they're coming from repeats. Uh, we don't really know how to work with them, and unfortunately, those reads are perfectly aligned, but we just put them aside in most of the time, unless, unless you have a special, special uh, question in hand. So here is, we already saw, Martin already showed you some of the uh, screenshots from UCSC browser, and here you can see, just from the UCSC browser, it's a custom tracks available for all of us, where people pre-compute map ability. So what does it show to us? Where we have one value of this track one, it means that uh, every, and for example, here is 50 bases. So we take 50 mirror, we take 50, 50 mirrors, which are covering this particular position. And if all of them are uniquely aligned, then the value of mobility there is one. When 40 out of 50 uniquely aligned, then uh, we, we have 80% of mobility, etc. So when, we, when you see those huge gaps, this is completely unmappable. And it's, as you can see, it's unmappable for 50 base pair long, for 75, and for 100. So even for 100 base pair long reads, we can't map uniquely this part. And fair enough, uh, down at the bottom here, we have repeat master track of UCSC, which shows us re repeats. And there is a huge, uh, and I think it's, it's uh, line repeat here. And line repeats are. Yeah, so that gives you an idea that you can actually assess what, what, so for example, if you done your experiment, you have your reads aligned, and in some region of interest near your beloved genes, you don't have any reads. You probably would like also to check whether there are no repeats around. Maybe there is no, it's not that there is no data around your genes, but you can't align them. So, uniquely. Is this is, that's, that's available for you, for you from UCSC browser. Oh, you can just, like yes, point. yeah, that's a track already, track already pre-compute. Yeah, yes. But do you do it your genome, it's not on the browser? Uh, you can load it, actually. 
maybe we can talk later about this it's but you can load anything you can fake fake uh, you can use human to displace the elegance or you can do whatever you like this job. Uh, so I more or less mentioned already that mappability affects our analysis. We sometimes, uh, that's also something for you to maybe to keep in mind. When you have, when you analyze data with completely, with, with different lengths, let's say one experiment 36 bases and another experiment 100 bases per long, the only way to really, really, Un unbiased, in unbiased way to analyze this data is to trim longer read to the shorter one, which is which sounds like insane, crazy. You lose your data, but that's the only way to compare apple to apples because otherwise you will see difference just due to different mappability in different locations, which you can't decipher. You can do all kind of corrections, but it's very very difficult, and people can criticize you for that. Um, sorry, so. If you want to train your uh, your data, like let's say you have a hundred bits, yes. you want to train it to seventy-five. How do you decide which? How how do you decide how you train it to have? <laughs> That's a good. Well, I guess from the from smart in talks, you just look at your QC. You see as well my read probably starting from position five to position something has the best quality. That would be your best, but. So you will be a little bit biased. You you will be yes. You need to you need to decide. You know, like when people ask us, students ask us the same question. Like typically, if you, if you want to be really really rigorous, you try several times. You try at the beginning, then position ten, position twenty. You repeat your experiment and you see where data looks better. But you typically don't have time for that, and you might not learn much. But this will be really really. Honest answer on your question. Try different and see what happens. But, yeah. So now we're coming, so we've done alignment, we know the ology of reads we got, and now let's talk how we store those alignments. What is the read, uh, what is the file format to store, to store um, uh, al al alignment results? Uh, so the current format is some uh, sequence alignment. I actually forgot the abbreviation for this. But some some file, and the every record for, of this file, it's an ASCII file. It contains information about one read and its alignment. It has eleven standard fields plus some uh, key, uh, rather arbitrary attributes which has key and value. But the after eleven, different aligners have different format. At the beginning of the some file. Uh, we have a header which tells us lots of information. It tells us about the reference genome and many other things. In the lab part, we can look into this a little bit more. So the BAM file BAM stands for binary. So BAM file is just a binary format of the sum uh, sum file. There is other other flavors of compression of the sum file. Uh, so the compression ra ratio roughly about five, a little bit more. Uh, the advantage of the BAM file, it can be indexed. So typically those files are huge, right? You have 50 million reads or 100 million reads. Now you have them arranged per chromosome. And for example, you would like to access chromosome 21. If you look through the SAM file, you go from the beginning and uh, scroll through the file. But uh, BAM file allow indexing and you can access directly the region of interest. Uh, so something uh, to mention that good aligners, when they, and BWA is good in this way, uh, they, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't manipulate with reads. So they store in the BAM file the read sequence and quality of the read in the original form, except the strand. Sometimes it's reverse complement the read. So in principle, having a BAM file, we can reconstruct our original FASTQ file. However, the order will not be preserved. Of course, FASTQ comes from the sequence in a certain order. When we have a BAM file, we, we, we lost this order. But good BAM file contains all information uh, of original sequence. But 
it's not all aligners. So there are some aligners with chopsy reads, chop sequences, drop se unaligned sequences, etc. Not all aligners. So beware that sometimes you can't really come back. If the, your only data comes from somebody and it's a bump file, it's not necessarily the whole experiment. Now let's talk a little bit about the header of this file. So the typical header would contain information about the genome we used and the, the format of the line would be like that. It will have this tag which, called, which name sequence and that sequence name. In this case, it's one. And sometimes it will be CHR standing for chromosome one. Sometimes it's one. All depends what was the name of the chromosome in your genome. And we will see this in the map part. And then it also contains, it can contain all kind of information. Important to keep information about the aligner and parameters we used that we can reconstruct. Uh, reconstruct. Um, but, uh, if somebody wants to repeat our alignment, one can do it, looking at the header of the, of the file. Now, those are 11, 11 standard, uh, standard files. Uh, standard lines, sorry, of the or standard fields in every every record. Uh, lots of information there. Lots of uh, you can learn a lot about uh, every read. And uh, those which has read asterisk, we will discuss in details. No questions so far. Can I go further? Okay. So the f the second field is a flag, and that's a binary flag. So basically, it comes to us when we look at the file. It comes, it, we see it as an integer. And it can be 161, 83, something. But if you look at the, at the bits, it's in the binary format, we have 11 different bits. And each of those has some significance. It tells us whether this is parent alignment or single end, whether the read is aligned, and it may be aligned or not. It tells us whether the read is number one or read is number two. It tells us whether the read failed quality, uh, manufacturing quality controls, this chastity filtering, or it tells us whether the read duplicated or not. So this is a little bit convoluted. However, some tools, which we are going to discuss in, 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 a, in a moment, they will allow us to filter reads based on the value of this flag. So for example, you would like only reads aligned on the negative strand. And you can choose the filter with this flag and only pick up those reads. You can do many, many, many different things. And it's very, very helpful. And here is an example. So capital minus, if we use some tools, and in later we'll discuss a little bit more about some tools. Uh, we talk about a little bit more about some tools. Capital minus capital F will we'll filter away uh, reads with certain flag and it's minus capital F 516 will filter 512 2 to the power 9 plus 2 to the power 2 plus 4 2 to the power 2 is unaligned reads so we are not interested in unaligned reads and in filter out those reads which chastity quality failed so when we add this flag and scroll through the file we have a subset of reads, only those which satisfy those criteria. And small letter F will actually uh, select on reads with certain flag. So here, only reads align on a positive strand, or only read one in, in uh, among all reads. So the fourth column, come back. So there is like one, two, three, and there is chromosome, read start. So the fourth column is read start and basically tells us the read start and uh, the only important, quite important thing, and this was a source of many errors in the early days, to remember, so when the read is aligned, uh, when uh, go to this picture, when the read is aligned on the positive strand, there's no problem. Here, this position, I'm circling it, is rep as reported as a start of the read. And we can easily, for example, if it's single end experiment and we would like to extend with certain average fragment lengths, 150, 175 paces, it's clear how to do it. We're just extending. If read is aligned on negative strand, the position is reported is here. It's actually not the end of the read, but the start of the read. 
it's not in other words it's not five prime end of the read so people were taking this position and even if they're extending using as a strand strand information if the read is line on negative strand we have to extend kind of backward in three prime direction but you have to use this location so in other words you have to add the read length to the start of the read this this was an error which was repeated multiple times one has to always remember that the strand on which read is aligned is also important so now the fifth column is mapping quality and you already heard about the fret score score the mapping quality is a fret score as well um, again some tools have a parameter minus uh, a, a lowercase q and here you can indicate mapping quality and only reads above this mapping quality will be accepted so mapping quality is minus log uh, minus 10 log of probability of false alignment and when probability is one it means that read is aligned in multiple locations so actually we don't know how to place it then uh, mapping quality is zero and then uh, the higher mapping quality is the higher uh, the smaller probability of false alignment is and the further away from multi-mapping we are so how how are we doing everything is okay yes Yes. How do you decide when you extend, and is there like a, some kind of an option on the PWA that allows you to do So the read extension is it's post processing. So BWA wouldn't know. BWA just align read as it is and reports as the start of the read alignment. Now, when we would like, and as you see in a few minutes, when we would like to calculate the coverage. We are not when we when we look at chip seek experiment. We are not only interested in the read because the fragment is actually uh, which fragment which originate from the immune precipitation is much longer than the read or often is much longer. So you would like when you calculate coverage to use the whole fragment, and you would like to one of the way one of the people do different things, but one of the way is to extend your read and look at the coverage of extended read, and this will naturally also occur when you have pair end, right? When you have pair end, you have the fragment already given to you and you profile those fragments as they are. But when you have single end read and there are lots of data publicly available is single end. Uh, so we already know what is advantage of pair. End. Maybe let me take a moment here. And so there are two advantages, two obvious advantages. So one of them is that we know precisely where the interaction between DNA, DNA and where modification happens, so what fragment we pulled out, right? When we know both reads, we know that the antibody was interacting somewhere between two reads. When we have a single end, we have to infer it. We take an average fragment length, extend it, and somewhere between the read start and the end of this extension, interaction happened, but it's more less less precise. And of course, the second advantage is uh, repetitive elements. When replacing, is much better. Uh, so now, how to decide? Um, so typically, some tools can analyze uh, your if it's pair end. Uh, si sorry, if it's single end experiment, uh, they can look at your data, and looking at reads on opposite strand, they can infer average fragment lengths, and then you know. Or even like Finder, in Finder we can infer again, not it's not never precise, the distribution. Alternative, you have your wet lab traces, uh, Martin showed Agilent traces. You can look at them and see the mode of the distribution, say, well, it's roughly 160. I should say that the, your final results, if you're in a reasonable, if you choose your extension reasonably, your final results will not depend very strongly on this. But of course, if you, if you instead of 150, you will choose your ex, um, extension 1,500 bases, your results will be very, very different. So, yeah. so mapping quality. And this is very confusing part of, of the, 
some format, but it's very useful for part. It's so called, it's uh, field number six, it's cigar string. Uh, cigar string essentially tells us how the read was scrambled during, during alignment. What was done to the read in order to actually place it in this location. It tells us how many bases were mapped without mismatches, or actually, sorry, mapped. And it could be with mismatches or without mismatches, but we are, as we said, we only allow two mismatches. Then it tells us whether we have insertion or deletion. It tells us whether part of the read was soft, so-called soft clipped. Uh, so soft clip means that sequence is there, but aligner by some reason decided not to use it in the alignment. In the, al in the alignment, it's actually start alignment somewhere in the middle of the read. And some aligners doing some brutal thing to the read, they actually hard clip reads. So they take their re the reads from the fast queue, and they say, well, I don't like this first ba the ten bases, chop it away and just forget about it. But then in cigar and only in cigar we can learn that this was done to our read. So all of this is rather important when you, when you do uh, variant, variant calling, because details in the cigar and how the read was placed is very important for the variant calling. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe this is a little bit, maybe let's skip it for now, and maybe when we have in the lab time, time we can come back to the cigar, because it's very, very technical, very dry, I don't think I can teach you within 10 minutes about how to decipher cigar string. Just remember there is a cigar string, magic cigar string, and some tools help it, help to decipher it, but you still need to understand all details of the cigar. Um, I have the different quizzes there, what this means. So cigar can look like this, it's really ugly. Looks really ugly. The, simple, the most simple way is this, like here's an example. If we have 100 base pair uh, uh, reads, then the nicest cigar is 100M. So we had 100 matches, nothing else. However, in many, many cases, we have situations like that. Three soft clips, 65 matches, six deletion. And that's deletion in the reference, remember. So it's insertion, actually, in our read. Deletion in the reference. Then we have another three matches. And then after this, we have two insertions in the reference, means deletion in the read. And then we have 53 matches. And if we add all those bits and pieces, we end up with 100. But that's how it looks. But it gives us a lot of information about the alignment. Let's maybe let's skip it. I, I feel it's, it would be nice to skip it. So now we're coming to some tools. And some tools is, is a C, uh, a C um, program, which used to manipulate with uh, BAM and some files. It has lots of options. If you, in the lab we will do it, if you just type some tools, you will see that it gives you help. Most of those bioinformatic tools, by the way, if you're completely stuck, you don't know what to do, just, just run it with no parameters. It gives you some help. And so there's different cate categories of tools, indexing, uh, indexing, uh, editing, uh, file operation, viewing, and statistics. And I would like to talk about Flagstat, and we had already question how to how to get statistics, and if we just type some tools, Flagstat, and then we give our BAM file, give us interesting statistics details, and we will do it during the lab. Now, viewing of some tools, uh, it's some tools view, and we give BAM file, which we would like to view. BAM file, if you just do less or any other command, Unix command to the BAM file, we will see gibberish. We can't really see it. But with uh, some tools view, we can see whatever we like. And here is there is a magic. When our file is indexed, when we run command some tools indexed BAM file, then in the same folder where our BAM file is, we create an index file and we will do it. Uh, then we can, we can view the certain region of this BAM file. When our command is some tools view, BAM file, chromosome, column, start, end, we only pick up reads belonging to this, to this region. And if you, if you run your experiment and you would like quickly, you know certain target, and you would like quickly to assess whether you have enrichment, you can, in five minutes, you can answer your question. You run this command, you see that 
your enrichment in this particular region, you get say thousand, thousand, uh, thousand reads, you have the same region, the same size, but randomly on the genome, run it five times, and randomly on the genome you have five reads, but in this particular thousand, you absolutely sure that at least this part is showing enrichment. So it's a good, good, good thing to know. Uh, next tools which we will are going to use and good, good to know also is Picard tools. Those are Java, uh, written by Broad, and the, again, when you look in the Picard, there are many, many, many different uh, tools you can use for manipulation with some uh, in BAM files. Very important for us is two. One is mark duplicates. When we have pair and reads, it's very difficult to say uh, which pair is duplicated because how would we know, right? We, because two reads have to be identical. So sometimes read one is identical. <coughs> Excuse me, but read two can be can have different uh, location. So Picard will help us with this. This is one, and second uh, or a second tool in Picards is merge sound files. Very often our experiment data is spread in multiple lanes or multiple chunks. It's even advisable sometimes spread spread your data to avoid certain biases, and then you want to merge them. And this this merge sound files will do it for us. So just for you to know that those are very simple tools, but to know uh, for you to know that they exist and sometimes useful to to, to use. So I, I came to the visualization part, and maybe you have any questions at this moment. Yes. Um, so when you're merging your, your when you have your class view from different names, is it better to merge than to merge the class view or to merge the sign? Uh, I, I, th I think it's better to use fast queues as they are and merge. Why? Uh, your fast queues coming sli from slightly different experiments, from slightly different experimental conditions, maybe from different sequencing machine. Or, so you would like to align and then to have your BOM file to maybe run stats on them and to see this fast queue has 90% of alignment and this one is only 30 then you would know that maybe this the whole flow cell had some problems. So it's it's better to you always can merge afterwards. So that's one thing. And also you actually when we do alignment, we artificially chop our fast queue in the smaller chunks and then put on a cluster to align with multiple multiple CPUs just to do it faster. And then we merge we merge, uh, we merge aligners, uh, alignment results. So now let's talk about visualization. Uh, there are lots of tools created for us to visualize uh, data. We can visualize BAM files. We can visualize product of BAM files. We, we can visualize files which um, post-process BAM files. Uh, we can use for that so why visualization is, is, is important? Because we, it's very important. Unfortunately, what we are doing, and I'm using this term very vaguely, but when we are looking at chip seq data and a lot of other next generation sequencing data, it's deep learning. Like human interaction is very, very important. We know very little about what to expect. We don't have theory behind our data. Therefore, we would like, so that's actually, everybody is ra eager to, as soon as data is out, everybody wants to look and to see how, how it looks. And you can visualize your data in IGV uh, tool. It's a Java tool or genome browser, WashU genome browser or UCC, which is web-based and very popular. IGV, it's Java, as I said, you can have a web start of Java. Uh, I will be using UCSC, uh, later because it's more accessible for us. You just type genome.ucc.edu and you can load your data and do whatever you, you like. Now, you, you already saw those type of pictures. Uh, this is like coverage tracks and that's what we do. This like from the data we are going to work with and we are working. This is H1 histone modifications at uh, top six tracks for the six marks uh, we discussed in the morning. Uh, 
in Martin's presentation, and the black one is input DNA. So just to repeat, input DNA is essentially in the modern experiments, people try to do the following. They do all steps of the library con of the library construction until immunoprecipitation, then they split the reagent into two tubes. One goes through the, uh, through the IP and another is not. And so they're identical data, but one is not IP. And then you denature, you remove proteins, and then sequence this input. Now, the belief was that this is the best background. It's good background to compare your data to what will be what. But of course, as Martin already said, there is a lot of biology just in input. This is one thing. And second, of course, when we do precipitation, our random reads are, there is a lot of non-specific reads. And they're not necessarily just the same reads as they would be in input. So even, even if our experiment completely failed, the, let's say we use antibody, which is non-specific, the results will be very different from, well, not very different, but different, especially in some locations from just input. That's uh, from experience. But nevertheless, input is good to have. You would like to see rather uniform coverage. And if your data is deep enough, you see details of nucleosome positioning there and many interesting things. So the two other tracks, lower tracks, is actually from, a, from ENCODE. We prepared for you just transcription factor. Uh, so protein DNA experiment, ChIP-seq. You can see nice peaks there. Uh, the green one is RNA-seq. That's beyond what we are talking at the moment. So now the question is, how to arrive to those use? This is, this is nice, right? We started with our FASTQ files. We run it through those little steps we just discussed. And then we have this view. We can, so here in UCC browser, there are genes. We can zoom in different genes and see whether, for example, the red track is hdk 4 ab 3 which is um, Mark, which uh, tells us about transcriptional activation of the gene. And when we have a, we can see a peak in the promoter of, or near TSS of a certain genes. This gene is probably expressed. It's very interesting. How to arrive to those? Um, the different uh, file format to visualize in UCSC. The simplest one is called BED file, BED format. And here there is an interesting decision which was done by UCSC people, UCSC folks, that this file which contains coordinate of the region. So every, every line in this file looks like this. Chromosome, some location, and another location. And the first location should be smaller, strictly smaller, than the second location. The first location is the start of the region, the second is the end of the region, but this is a zero-based. So if, 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 actual, if our region actually is 400,061, in our bet file, we put six, 60, uh, 600, 400,600, not 601. So this is something when always come up and people make a lot of mistakes here. We, one base, you think sometimes it doesn't matter. It does. You will quickly learn that it, will, it, 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 it matters. So remember that this bet file is zero based. So if our coordinate starts at 10, in the bat file, we enter it as nine. This is, we, we don't, it's hard to explain why, but there's probably some reasons. Not all their files, zero based, but this one is. So the next file is a weak file, and it has a very tricky format. It has multiple flavors. I will talk about the simplest flavor. And it is important when we have coverage profile when varies very rapidly. When we have, we kind of don't have continuous coverage with the same value. So this have a fixed step line. It has a line where the coverage starts. So here's chromosome three, start. Just to give you an idea how it looks, we have a tool which will generate this file for us. Uh, the last format I would like to mention is bed graph format. Uh, technically speaking, it's a format which is equivalent to the weak format, 
and there is always trade-off. Sometimes it's been more beneficial to use uh, weak format, sometimes bad graph format. So bad graph is exactly like bad. Uh, it has chromosome start end, but it also has a value. It has actually coverage. So essentially, I use whiteboard. Um, too complicated, maybe just with my hand. So essentially, you have start and end and the value, the height of the tower you would like to display. If you have a bad format, only start and end, and it will be the same, just a box of the same height. But score, the score will distinguish different locations. Yes? So does that score just the count of the sequences that overlap? Anything you like. If, if you would like to have, yes, but we can normalize it. And it can be float number as well. It can be anything. But of course, the most parsimonious is just coverage, as you, as you said. If we take every fragment as one, we stack them on top of each other, and in every position we can have just integer number. But it can be normalized. And sometimes we would like to normalize because, for example, we compare two libraries of very different depths. The rather naive but pretty well working solution would be let's divide it by the total number of its in the library then we kind of can compare two libraries to each other. So now to generate WIG file, we will be using uh, bound to wig tool, which uh, we created. And uh, yeah, so, but that's, that's in, in the lab part. So now what else can we say? I, I just wanted to give you a few examples of what can we do with the data prior to calling enrichments. So of course, the next we have our data, we look in the browser, we would like to call enrichment, to have a set of locations, set of genes, which, which have some uh, special significant marking. But we can do certain things even before enrichment, just looking at the raw alignment data. Uh, one of the, it, and it, it is a QC, and it is some of them, uh, Martin showed you the plots, which have those bars, which tells us how many reads falling in the promoters of the gene. So after alignments, we can just have 20,000 coding genes. We take transcription start, and transcription start site of every gene, a step maybe 1,500 bases on either side, have a 3KB region, and let's check how many reads falling into all these 20,000 3KB regions. And compare to like different, we can do different things. We can say what is a fraction of total number of reads it is, or what would be the uh, number of reads comparing to uh, the same genome, random genome region. And if we see that for the mark we expect to be located at TSS, we have enrichment, we, we are happy, without even doing very sophisticated work. And here I'm showing you an example. It's, it's a cartoon example where what this plot shows. I calculated the mean coverage near the TSS in the promoter of 20,000 coding genes and look at the distribution and it is a red curve. And the blue curve is the same when I take 100,000 random genomic location of the same size, right? And calculate mean coverage. So, yeah, you can call them this way if you, yes, why not? So, so let, let's explain, I, I apologize, I probably should put it on the slide now. So this is our picture. We have genome and we have our coverage profile. It goes like that. And here we have genes. This gene transcribed this way. There is another gene. Transcribe this way. So what, what I was just suggesting is the following. We can take gene annotation system, like going to Ensemble or going to UCSC, take all locations of the TSS of the gene. This will be this point and this point, and 20,000 other points in the genome. I don't know the coding genes. Take regions which are 3KB. Take regions everywhere. And then calculate mean coverage which will be integral here, divided by the size of this region, but the size is the same. And for every gene, we have a number, ci. And this i 
goes from 1 to 20,000. So we have 20,000 numbers for every gene. Now we take the same region somewhere outside of the T cells of the gene, somewhere on the genome, and do exactly the same randomly. Calculate, sometimes it's recommended more than 20,000, maybe 100,000 times. And calculate the signal outside of the T cells. And that's what I plot there. So the blue curve is random curve, and the red curve at the TSS. So in this particular case, and if it was, it was at CK4 ME3, definitely our experiment worked. Our signal at TSS, the red curve, shifted on the right. So on average, we have much more reads at the promoter of the gene than anywhere else at the genome. So is it kind of something which you think, yeah. Um, so now in, in a, another set of plots, uh, which you can do right away without calling any enrichments, is to look at the, so instead of looking at the mean signal in the whole promoter, now let's look at the coverage in a different, uh, along a different axis, let's put it this way. Let's look how profile look like for all genes. So now if I come back to the same, to the same uh, drawing here, we take all those profile in every location for every for all 20,000 genes and stack them together, sum them together. Right? We take one, another one, and sum on top of each other. Because all of them is just a row of 3,000 numbers. We have 3,000 numbers, 3,000 numbers, 3,000 numbers, 3,000 numbers. We stack them all together. I, I hope I, I, I'm not losing you, but if I am, just please let me know. So if, if we do this, and then we look at those, at those four marks we discussed, which Martin, Martin mentioned to you, the first one is htk 4 ma 3 Let's look at this plot. So the line here in the middle is a transcription start site. So that's exactly where the gene starts. So on the left is 5 prime, prime end and 3 prime end. By the way, when I said stack those profiles on top of each other using the strand, if the gene is on the negative strand, we flip it, reverse it, right? We always want 5 prime be on the left and 3 prime on the left. And then we see this very interesting characteristic profile, and I'm pretty sure some of you are, are, are familiar, some of, some of you, uh, many of you, <laughs> Uh, probably familiar with those. And anecdotally, this type of plot, which I just like calculated for the sake of this uh, this presentation, but say five years ago, it could be published in, in journal. It was news. Now it's routine for us. We look at those and we, we, we kind of think that this is type of QC. If those profiles look the way they are on the screen, then the data is okay. You can see that the, there is a gap at the, at the TSS which represents the missing nucleosome. And then you see the increase of coverage inside the, the gene at the uh, five prime UTR or first exon. And then it winds down uh, in the body of the gene. On the right, there is a K36 ME3, another mark, which is elongation mark. This mark covers exon or gene body of actively transcribed genes. So at the transcription start site, it's still missing, but then it's Start, start growing, etc. So this type of profiles, we can learn from this type profile something. So uh, now the black curve is input, this famous input we were talking about. You can see some interesting, interesting features. When the mark is highly enriched, like the red one, it's CK4 ME3, the, uh, all plots have different scales. So here's 25, and we almost don't see input. Input is a flat line. When we have small enrichment, for example, let's look at the very last plot, a CK9 ME3, we know that this mark is not present at the TSS of most of the genes, only present at TSS of a handful of development implicated genes. We don't have this mark. The size of coverage there, very similar between input and the mark itself. And you can see that input has a certain peak at TSS. And this type of behavior is very experiment specific. I can't say that you always see peak 
Sometimes you see trough. In fact, from my experience, depends whether it's uh, single end data or parent data, you see different features. But it is related to the structure of chromatin. If chromatin is more open at the TSS of the gene, it's easy to share and the fragment will start more readily in this location. So that's why we might expect. Yeah, and then there, repressive mark, HCK27, this acetylation is not repressive, it's enhancer mark also has uh, very similar to hdk 4 me 3 double hump uh, picture, and most of them will have a trove at TSS just because there are no, no nucleosomes there. All right, that's just a representation. That's uh, just, oh, natural break. I I was in the um, some symposium few, at UBC a few weeks, a few months ago, and somebody showed this picture, and I found it kind of interesting. It was a epigenetic symposium, and I googled it. So basically, I typed epigenetics and then went to images right away. And fair enough, like image number six was this one. So I, so basically, what we will be talking now, this finding enrichment, etc., is more like, more like an art. And yes, so the advice here is that if somebody asks you that you don't understand, say it's due to epigenetic. Epigenetics now is is actually, um, yeah. So now um, we will be talking at the very last uh, part of all of this. I, I have, I think, 10 minutes to talk about enrichment, and we will be doing this also in the lab. So what is the main challenge? How to find enrichment uh, when we're talking about a chip seek experiment? Because probably for chip seek experiment, we expect, our expectations are least obvious. So for other type, types of types of data, we have more expectation. For chip seek, we have no theory. We don't know what to expect. That's one thing. We is data driven. The data tells us what we observe. Now we don't have any analytical, or we, in many cases, we don't have true analytical knowledge about the distributions which, which are behind the data we see. We don't know what. What are distributions for the background? We don't know what are distribution for our chip seek signal. Yes, Poisson, probably it's count data, probably Poisson. But when we look at the data and try to feed Poisson to the data, we see that hmm, sometimes it is Poisson, sometimes it's not nearly Poisson. Although it's the same type of um, uh, experiment, maybe done in different, uh, with slightly different cell types or done in different time, different sequencers. So that's a major challenge. We don't know how to discriminate between signal and background because we don't know distribution for neither signal for no background. Now, all experiments have biases and have experimental artifacts. We also don't know about those. And sometimes we can't avoid them. We have rare cells or data which, which will be full of of artifact. So that's the first first thing which we can stumble across when we look at the alignment. And we look at the, if you browse our data long enough, we come across something like that. And you can tell me what is wrong about this. So that's exactly what we already saw. This is six marks. The black one is input, the pink and this blue is actually transcription factor binding experiments. What is special about this observation, what we see here? It's kind of bothering. Yes, they look very similar. You will be suspicious why activating mark and repressing mark look so similar. This is typical view of alignment artifact. You can see thousands of those when you, on, on genome, entire human genome, there will be thousands of those locations where we will see something like that. It's a little bit experiment specific, it is. It depends on the read length, fragment size, but we will see those, and we would like to get rid of those. And that's uh, not always we have luxury to have all six marks. So sometimes we have one chip seek experiment and one input, and then what we are doing, we are looking that our chip seek experiment, say blue, and input look very similar. So then we are getting suspicious and probably, probably blacklisting those locations. So alignment artifacts, what are the origin of those? Uh, 
very likely the origin of those is just multiple copies of certain sequence in the sample genome, which are not present in the reference. So it's essentially in the sample, we have multiple copies of certain sequence. As a result, we have many reads coming from those multiple copies. When we align them back to the genome, they align to exactly the same location. So we grow tower artificially. So they were all just non-specific reads, but there are so many locations that they come back to the same genomic location and present alignment artifact. So what we would like to do, sometimes people, if they have thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands in each location, they say, well, 1,000, maybe I can live with it. But the problem is that when you compare several data sets, they will always com come into your Venn diagram intersection. When you do, this is my set one, set two, intersect, and you have some thousand or 5,000, maybe common locations. Out of this 5,000 common, 1,000 will be this artifactual. You don't want it. You would like to get rid of those. So that's result from uh, like a finder, finder tool. And you can see here that the black is actually profile of your input experiment. It's chromosome one. Here is centromere. So uh, near centromeric regions have lots of this artifactual alignments. This is a log scale. We took a log scale of coverage. So you can imagine these towers are tens of thousands in coverage, while average couch is 10, but you have location where you have huge towers which, would, which appear to you as enriched, but they have to be discarded. Now, what I would like to mention, just for your knowledge, we're not going into many details, uh, surprisingly, those artifacts are a little bit cell type specific. Most, in most, most of them are kind of coming again and again in different experiments. They are recurrent, but there are certain locations which are specific. And you can see here, uh, this is colon cancer example, and we see it here, but with nothing, nothing in mammary gland. And in thyroid. So, um, like this is almost the same data, but the blue is those locations which we used from ENCODE. So, ENCODE published blacklisted regions. So, regions which are those alignment artifacts which are recurrent. And they published them both for human and mouse. And you can see that, truly enough, most of them, most of the red which we identified just kind of de novo for this experiment, this particular data set, uh, they coincide with blue regions which are blacklisted, but there is some subset which, are, which is not. So you have alternative using blacklist, blacklisted uh, regions or uh, doing it de novo. And here's example for both mouse and human. So now uh, Finder is basically tool which is, which are developing, we are actively developing and um, hoping to uh, to finalize. So what is the problem with those analysis? As, as Martin mentioned, this is a hot area for research. There is a big list, there is lots of papers which even comparing multiple tools, there are maybe 50 different tools, all deal with calling in rich regions for chip seek experiments. They all have different flavors and different focuses. Some of them are funny. Some of them are specifically d designed for a single end experiment. And they're using, they're using, um, they're using single end experiment, they, they're using advantages in quotes of single end experiment. But this is just because people try to do their best for the analysis. Now, most of these tools using a limited set of data to validate. Uh, their tools, and as a result, sometimes you fall in a trap of overfitting. You basically have a number of free parameters, and you adjust those three parameters in a way that your data is described best. Of course, when the new data comes, uh, you may have a problem, and I have, I'm having problems all the time with Finder, that it's very easy to get into this rabbit hole, um, rabbit hole to try to fit your few parameters uh, to the data. So then the idea we had now is to have as less parameters as possible and almost no parameters. Try to be, trying to use 
data classification approach rather than any feed of the background model to Poisson or negative binomial, which was used in many other tools. So we'll be short here. You have this in your slide. The tool which is probably the most popular, the tool which is fairly fair, fair to say works, is Max, which was first published in 2008. It was a big, big evolution for this tool, but we still think that this tool is was designed for the data was not was not of the data kind we are looking now, not as deep as the data we are looking now. I probably leave it if you have questions. Now we can talk about details on, on, on those. There is references, and maybe I finish it talking about narrow versus broad, uh, broad regions. Um, I think most of the tools, and you heard already this, this uh, slogan about so, so some of them, some of the peaks are punctated, or some of the regions are punctated or peaks, and some of broad regions, broad domains. That's because of the nature of what we see actually in the browser or we see as enriched. Of course, when we talk about the basic enrichment, it happens at nucleosomal level. So one nucleosome, when it's histone modification, it's either marked or not. Now, some of the marks, like HDK4, ME3, they happen in several neighboring nucleosomes, maybe 10 or maybe 5. Those are marked, and then we have nothing. So then, as a result, they appear as a cluster, relatively compact cluster. Some of the mark happens as regions where multiple nucleosomes, which are juxtaposed to each other, uh, all marked. And those regions can be up to 100 KB or even, even more. It's kind of effect of spreading. If we look back into our yeah, into this plot. Oops. So those are human embryonic stem cells, and like, for example, if you look into this track, the purple one, it is H3K4, H3K36 ME3. As we mentioned already, those are elongations, those are marked on top of the actively transcribed genes. And sometimes you have genes which are long, and they will be covered or carpeted by this mark rather significantly, so killer basis of this mark. Now the red one is very punctated. This is HCK4 emissary. Now the, the brown one is HCK27 ME3. So you probably heard that those are uh, extended mark, so broad mark. However, and in many, in most uh, differentiated cells, that's what you will see. So this is rather broad mark domain. Often it has shape like that. It has. It has peak, which has a neighboring broad domain. It's very, very frequent, very frequent situation. But in embryonic embryonic stem cells, actually, HCK27 ME3 looks as a very compact mark. So maybe it's not. It's the data we've chosen to go with. But the look of the HCK27 ME3 repressive mark is different from what you would normally see in other data sets. Just wanted to mention this. Uh, now, also, maybe one thing to mention also before my my laptop will die, but and before we go to the break, is uh, that what we have, what, let's, let's roll back and actually ask what we are seeing here. We see different heights. So now our experiment were done on multiple cells. In this particular case, it's probably tens of millions of cells. And we see in some locations coverage 50, in some coverage 100. So 100 DNA molecules were stuck to each other, in another 200, in another 10. So what does it mean? It means probably frequency of this mark in a certain, in a certain cell. So just to mention this, that's not a single cell experiment. We are looking at the average of the bulk bulk of mark. And when the mark is a little bit lower, it means that it's less probable 
to have this mark here. So it's present in some cells, it's not present in others. When we have more, like modular alignment artifact, modular experimental artifact, right? So sometimes you have lower coverage just due to mobility, which we discussed, or other things. Yeah. So and with this, I would like to more or less, I think, finish.